Um, it, the, well, to take one of the other question types then, the yes-no questions, we found that um, yes-no questions were uh, frequent in both examination in chief and in cross-examination. There were 37 examples out of 70 uh, questions in, cross -ex in examination in chief and 17 in cross-examination. So um, let's think about what these are doing in examination in chief. If we just look at the statistics, yes, no questions, control the answer, don't they? Uh, just a yes or a no. So you might say that we might expect those to be more frequent in cross-examination. So control is also important in examination in chief. What's going on here then when we look at some of these examples, do you think? It's almost as if the, the lawyer is, is, is constructing the story as they want that would be beneficial to their case rather than allowing the witness to say what they want and perhaps, you know, doing themselves a misjustice. Um, so one of the things that they're doing then is um, the lawyer telling the story. Yeah. These are um, narrative questions. Let's find an example then to um, explain this. Um, a yes-no question the, where, the, where the lawyer is um, telling the story in examination in chief. Um, well, we've got a couple here. So we've got, but was she in fact registered with another doctor at the practice to which... Harold Shipman replies, she was, and then the lawyer says, when you set up in Market Street High, did she thereafter register with your practice, to which he replies, she did. So it's just seeking confirmation of the question um, and constructing the narrative together to, so it's beneficial for their case. Okay, and we know that before a trial, um, one of the jobs that the police do is to take statements from uh, witnesses and the defendant. Um, and one of the things that we can do if we look at the trial is to look at the statements in this particular case, some of the statements that have been taken. So one of the things that the lawyer is doing is, is taking the witness through their evidence. Yeah. Uh, and, and this isn't the first time that they've, they've told this story, is it? It's a, it's a story that, that's um, been told in the police interview too. Okay, right, so we've looked at a very small sample of data here, haven't we? What have we found? Let's try to summarise what we've found then in our brief investigation. Well, on a, on a very functional level, we've found how an understanding of the grammar of questions, a basic understanding of the grammar of questions can be applied to have interesting findings in a, in a, in a real case. Uh, and if we were going to scale this up into um, a little research project, um, we'd want more than 4,000 yeah. words of data, wouldn't we? Because we've only got 140 questions here. So one of the things we could do is collect a larger sample. Uh, and what might be some of the questions that we would be interested in asking, having conducted this little pilot investigation? Um, what, what might we want to ask? Uh, well, we might look at, again, the same sort of things as what what is the form versus the function of the questions. But then we could also look at the kind of answers that these questions are eliciting. So are they really eliciting this confirmation or do we get more conflict and challenge to the witnesses? Yeah, so do yes or no questions get yes, no, yes mm -hmm. or no answers? And if they don't, what kind of answers do they get? Do witnesses sometimes challenge the question? Yeah. As well, the kind of, if there's any relationship between the type of questions and what's being asked. So like we said, that sometimes it can just be confirming dates but when it comes to more crucial things to the case, things like maybe asking him outright if he's done something, what type of questions are used in that kind of situation mm -hmm. and how he answers them. Yeah, um, and because we found that tag questions are more frequent in cross-examination, we might want to look at um, a very specific linguistic question, um, just tag questions in cross-examination. Yeah. What do they look like? How are they used? Some of the questions in this sample are actually um, quite interesting to look at, the tag questions, aren't they? When we were coding the questions, we found that sometimes the tag didn't come at the end of the question, as we might find in a grammar. The isn't it sometimes was in the middle of yeah. the question, so not at the end. So we might look at those particular forms, because quite often grammar isn't just 
uh, haphazard. There's a reason, isn't there? We, yeah. we use particular forms for purposes, for function. So what's going on when those tags are in the middle of the question and not at the end? Um, so we can um, ask um, a whole range of questions, can't we? Our initial study brings up as many questions, as many future questions to answer as it does uh, to provide answers. Absolutely. Something that can be done in half an hour can give you the ideas and the inspiration to do a much larger project on to answer those questions that have been raised. Yeah. Um, and devising your own questions from a small data set or from a slightly larger one than this is part of constructing a project, isn't it? Yeah. For, what, one of the first things to do is to think, what questions can I ask? What are the interesting questions yeah, exactly. to ask? In fact, with this, even with this small sample, it would be not an it would be not an important research question at all to ask anything about alternative questions, would it? Because there aren't any. Yeah. Um, although, well, perhaps it would. Well, but why aren't there any? Isn't a very good research question. It's much more interesting, isn't it, to f focus on some of the patterns that significant patterns that s start to emerge from the data. Yeah. Um, and this shows us, too, why, how a little pilot study with a small sample of data can help to generate questions for a larger study. 